Buenos días. De repente quieren a estirarse un poco, ¿no? Moverse un poco. ¿Para qué? Uh, gracias de nuevo a los organizadores. Gracias de nuevo a la grata invitación. Siempre es muy lindo de estar en Europa, en, uh, en España, este precioso lugar, esta preciosa universidad. Me han pedido que haga mi presentación en inglés, entonces mis acetatos mis, están en, en español, pero yo lo voy a hacer en inglés. So my, my talk is going to be in a less intense, less energy ways of treating water and uh, in the context of uh, watershed integrated management. So I'm going to talk about um, lakes in Canada. It's a case study. Uh, there are so many reasons because our thousands of lakes become um, contaminated, particularly when we are close to agricultural areas or when we are close to contaminated sites or urban settings. So m the main real cause is phosphorus, nitrogen, that acts as, nu as nutrients. I have done a lot of work. I've been working in this area for the last uh, almost 30 years, and I have concentrated in the south part of, of Quebec. And um, but today, particularly, I'm going to talk about the St. Augustine Lake, which is the last urban lake in the south of Quebec, uh, near the Quebec City, where I live. So very quickly, eutrophication. You know, eutrophication is a natural process that can take from thousands to hundreds of years in order to turn into a wetland. A lake will turn into a lake in millions and hundreds of years. But when we are present there as humans and we put agriculture, urban settings, highways, and uh, all kinds of uh, man-made activities, we accelerate this process very, very fast. So the consequences of this is the, uh, um, reduce the reduction of biodiversity. We change the chemical characteristics of water, not only physically, but also biological and aesthetically. Um, and mainly, we stop the, uh, the ecological uses of water. So instead of having water for recreation, for, for resources of water, drinking water, um, we stop having these possibilities. And so far, we don't have a, a price to put on, on these activities. So it's very difficult to, to say when we need to act uh, in front of these uh, contaminated lakes. Ultimately, when uh, we have cyanobacteria, like Maria mentioned, there is toxins. And then you cannot bait. You cannot, uh, you cannot do many of activities. So this is a, a very old work that I did for Ministry of Environment in Quebec, where they asked me to analyze the data from 154 lakes. And uh, I took the data from chlorophyll, total phosphorus, transparency, nitrogen, and uh, I start to classify the quality of the lakes in terms of uh, these parameters. So at that time, you know, um, we came out with very, very interesting results about lakes that were without oxygen, very low transparency, high concentration of phosphorus, and contaminated sediments. And uh, St. Augustine Lake came as the worst uh, lake in, uh, in the Quebec province. So of course, you know, you can do, when you have all this data, you can put in relation chlorophyll with total phosphorus, biomass, with transparency, and that you come with the, the more phosphorus, the more biomass, the more cyanobacteria, the less transparency. So you can identify phosphorus as being the reason, the cause of all this problem. And then you can start thinking that, OK, if phosphorus is the cause, we can control maybe the phosphorus. And so um, we gave to the government a list of priority lakes and uh, the worst case, as I said, was St. Augustine. But interestingly, right after St. Augustine, it was in the third place, St. Charles Lake. And St. Charles Lake is the water source for the whole city of Quebec. So like, they were really, really worried. Because what, what to do if this St. Charles Lake cannot be anymore 
the drinking water source. So the government said, let's uh, use this opportunity to develop um, passive systems uh, in a integ uh, watershed integrated fashion, um, low energy, but that will solve the problem in a permanent way, long term, uh, using sustainable development principles. So there was a contest, and there were four grants of a couple of million dollars to try new technology. So I presented a project in the area of eco-engineering. Passive system, low energy, um, treat, uh, residues has to be treated in the territory of the lake, and uh, it has to be a very simple gravitational system. So let me talk to you about Lake St. Augustine, the past and the present. So you know, it used to be a forest, a watershed surrounded by forest, with a little bit of agriculture for the first French settlers. And then it became increasingly, increasingly um, agriculture intensive, and because of its proximity to uh, Quebec City, it became highly urbanized. And uh, out of the many influence and affluence that, that it had, everything got reduced to three. Two um, run, uh, runoff affluence that come from this very high intense traffic uh, uh, highway, A40, and then a little a small um, effluent that will take the water to St. Lawrence River, which is very close. So this lake is considered hyperotrophic. Sediments are loaded with nutrients, phosphorus, but it also has some heavy metals. And it also has the problem, which uh, in Quebec we have, um, which is the contamination by uh, de-icing salts. Because we, are, we have winter for five months, and uh, highways and, and, uh, and streets get loaded with snow, so we have to pour ourselves lots of salt. And these salts, just by surface runoff, end up in the, in the waterways and in the lakes. This is a, a very interesting um, graph. Somebody, my colleagues from paleolimnology, they went to the uh, middle of the lake, and they took one uh, meter carrot at the center of the lake. And every centimeter, they cut it, and they observe it into the microscope. And they identify the different bacteria, different algae that were there. And they dated the column uh, using lead 210. So we have the date, and we have the different algae that were present. So we have a family of algae that is represented of oligomesotrophic lake, which means high quality. And then we have algae represented of eutrophic lake and hyper eutrophic lake. So what we can see is when the lake is in good quality, there is a high biodiversity. When there is eutrophic situations, that the biodiversity gets reduced by a lot. Now, what one can see, one can see that 70, 80 years ago, there was a lot of, of algae representative of a very nice, high quality lake. But after urbanization started in the 70s, and we put this highway, then all of a sudden this algae disappears, and then the eutrophic uh, represented algae start becoming um, present. So again, you know, we can see the cost, cost effect, cost effect, which is very important because we need to determine who's going to pay for these, uh, for these treatments. So rehabilitation plan needed to follow, as I mentioned, some principles. Protection of human health, protection of the ecosystem, respect of sustainable development principles. Uh, it has to treat the whole water superficial and groundwater because this lake is, um, is fed by groundwater. And we have to use actions that um, take place more in situ and not ex situ. So since the year 2000, I've been using this lake for uh, demonstrating several techniques. 
and uh, today I'm going to uh, present you two. So we have the uh, problem with the phosphorus and the heavy metals and the deicing salt, and we have two pilot projects. The first is to treat, control the phosphorus at the bottom of the lake, and the second one is to try to clear, treat the deicing salts. I will call project one and project two. So just to show you the um, conditions and the characteristics of this uh, watershed is that uh, because it's very close to the city, we have a lot of wells from Minister of Environment, from Minister, from Minister of Transport, and with this piezometric uh, groundwater data, we did some characterization of the watershed. So we know that the lake is mainly um, uh, recharged by groundwater. We have the agricultural zone in the high, um, high levels on one side of the lake. This is the lake, very shallow lake. Then we have the highway, and then we have an urban area, and also this runoff comes down to the lake. You know? So we see that groundwater comes from the north and comes down just by gravity, and is going to go down to the St. Lawrence River. It is a small lake, um, very shallow lake, but it has the advantage that its water is renewed two times in a year. So that is very encouraging because that means that uh, water gets new, wa new water gets into the lake, and so that's very interesting. So we know that 37% is groundwater and 47% is runoff water coming from rain and, and, and runoff. When we take a look to the lake and the shores, we can identify some um, sources of contamination. We have here, this is an agricultural farm that has all this area and that uh, the effluent comes here, bringing with the farm the phosphorus, the nitrogen, and, um, and other contaminants. We have here a hydroplane station, which brings a lot of gasoline and, you know, with it, heavy metals. We have the affluent coming from the highway, A40, here. And we have other, other things. And we have also monitoring wells, which are actually resi residential wells. People live there and have their wells, and uh, we had permission to go to uh, monitor these wells. So in general, just to show you a portrait of the quality in the watershed, is that uh, we have pH in the water lake, in the groundwater, into the uh, trenches coming from, uh, the, uh, from the highway, and the sediments at the bottom of the lake. So something very interesting is that you can see that the pH comes very high when it's in the sediments and when it comes from the effluents from the highway because of the salt. Then the, high, the um, electrical conductivity, as you can see, is very, very high in the lake. It, it should be 250 because this is fresh water, but it's not. It goes into the thousands. Even groundwater already is contaminated because groundwater should also show some condu electrical conductivity of in the 200, maximum 300. We have a lot of phosphorus. As you see in the lake, it is in micrograms per liter. We have some phosphorus already in the groundwater, but the main source of phosphorus is the sediments because of all these years of agriculture. So these sediments accumulated a lot of phosphorus, which goes into 1,200 milligrams per kilogram, which is incredibly high. And the extractable part what comes easily when we wash it with the water is 200 milligrams per kilogram. Moreover, in the sediments, because of these hydroplanes and the gasoline and the highway also, we find heavy metals that are related to gasoline, like cadmium, copper, lead, and zinc. So it's a like very bad situation for this lake. So this is the quality criteria, and, and they were exceeded by a lot. So we had cadmium and lead, as I said, in the bottom of the sediment. It became clear that the bottom of the sediments was a big problem because groundwater is coming, 
it's coming by the bottom, it's passing through all these contaminated sediments, and heavy metals and phosphorus are coming every spring when the water uh, increases. When we um, uh, start mapping the contamination, this came very evident. You know, so this red, it's called the hot spots, and it came very evident that they are related to the sources that I explained. So one of the first actions was to inform the municipality that this was a focus of contamination, that the hydroplane was a focus of contamination, and the efflu affluent coming from the highway was also. So they started already by 2005, they start to treating or uh, taking away these sources of pollution. So hydroplanes today doesn't exist anymore, and this farm has to treat the water. Still, at the bottom of the sediment of the lake lies lots of contaminated sediments. So project one, we came with this idea. We said, we say groundwater is coming, groundwater is coming every spring, is passing through this layer of contaminated sediment, and is putting in the water column phosphorus and heavy metals. This is not good. Actually, we also saw that the fish diminish over the years, and we also saw that uh, uh, invasive species of uh, a snail was uh, very present in the, in the bottom of the, of the lake. So we have this idea. We say, OK, for the phosphorus that is in the water column, why don't we use alum and we coagulate alum so to bring down the concentration of phosphorus in the water, but then we can maybe put a, an active layer of a um, given mineral that can capture some of the phosphorus that is coming from the um, um, resurgence of the groundwater. And this active layer could be used to precipitate phosphorus to bind the uh, metals and uh, what about using calcite, which is a, a mineral that is less expensive. It's very easy for us to get because we have plenty of uh, quarries. And also because it can serve as a, um, as a buffer and it's a non-toxic. So this was one first idea. And what we did was simulate this process in uh, small columns, but also um, full scale columns. So this is this experiment here has the water from the lake, the same height, and you can see that it was green. We simulated groundwater passing from the bottom, passing through this layer of contaminated sediments that we took intact, intact from the bottom of the sediment, and we start simulating the groundwater like every spring, the way it passes. We put the, the alarm and we uh, coagulated the phosphorus and we simulated five years of passing. So the water remained clear, which was very interesting, and at the end of the experiment, we took out the, um, all the layers and we analyzed them. So what we saw is that sediments, the bottom sediments here, all these sediments, were very rich in phosphorus and in heavy metals, as, I, as we mentioned before. And when the water, the groundwater was passing, yes, phosphorus was mobilized, heavy metals were mobilized, but they had this barrier, this barrier of calcite gravel that allow the water to pass and what we observe is that phosphorus precipitated with calcite and also uh, uh, retain heavy metals. So we saw that, for example, initial phosphorus was 200 micrograms per liter, but when the, we treat it, we, we bring it down to 30 to 40 micrograms uh, of phosphorus per liter. Our target was 30 because that's what the Minister of Environment told us, 30, let's start with 30. So this was very good. We retained 100% of the metals, the lead, the zinc, um, the cadmium, 
and, uh, and we were using exactly the same gradient that in the field. So for us, this was a very successful pilot study in the lab. Also, we used microscope, electronic microscopy to try to see how the metals were retained, and we uh, saw that carbonates retained copper, retained zinc, retained lead. So that was also very good news. The project two, what happened when we did that, I show you that column and the identification of the algae, we, we found something else too. We found here is again a column of the sediments and here is the date with two, late 2010, but here is the algae from um, um, salt water. And they're not supposed to be there because this is a freshwater lake. But because we have been pouring and pouring and pouring salt and salt and salt, we were transforming this freshwater lake into a brackish type of, of lake. So we found these species of algae that are uh, present in a very important concentrations. So as I said, before the construction of the highway, we were in the normal of electrical conductivity, 200 microsiemens per centimeter, but then, but, and still now is a little bit higher, we were in the 1,800 microsiemens per centimeters. So Ministry of, in, of Transport uses 95 tons per kilometer per year to treat the highways. So this is incredible, huge amounts. So one thing that we told them is that they have to look in ways, other ways, to try to reduce this alt input, which has, they have been trying. So they have reduced that, and the situation has improved. So we went, I told you there was some piezometers, but also we went to the trenches in the highway. So in the trenches beside the highway, we found concentration of sodium and chloride, very, very high concentrations. And uh, the lake also presented high concentration of chloride and, and sodium. So for this second project, we say something. We said, okay, what about, because we had some land available, what about constructing a adapted wetland, not using typical plants, but using halophyte plants that can absorb some of the salt. And because still the metals are there and because is the phosphorus is there, what about having a, um, having a, what do you call it in English? It's a filter bed, an active filter bed, using again this um, calcite. So this, this is a, a filtering bed. We have calcite, we have the, the flow coming, and we are planning to retain the phosphorus and the heavy metals and maybe some of the salts. So we use different gra uh, grain size because we need to have a highly permeable um, um, material in order to receive all this uh, concentration of uh, this high high flow of water. The other important thing to, to know is that wetlands in uh, Quebec cannot work year long because we have a very long winter. So our wetlands start growing the plants around April and uh, in summer by August, they are in full height, full development. So we needed the uh, filtering bed working before the, um, the wetland. So you all know what is a wetland, so I don't need to explain what it's a wetland. Uh, it uses processes, microbiological, biological, physical, chemical, to treat this effluent. No? In this case, as I said, we wanted a special plants that can treat this um, water that is coming from the uh, highway runoff that is concentrated with salt. So, where do we find these uh, halophyte plants? So we are very close to the St. Lawrence estuary, and in the St. Lawrence estuary, we have the ocean water coming in, 
and the river coming out. And it's a very rich environment ecosystem where there is plenty of a variety of plants. Some ones are a strict halophytes, others are tolerant to salt. So we identify in Kamuraska, which is one hour and a half from Quebec, um, many of these indigenous um, salt tolerant or halophytic plants. So initially we started with four plants, but you will see that later we came even with 20 plants. So we took these plants and we developed them in chambers, environmental chambers in our lab, and we tried to uh, see which ones were better absorbing um, the salts. So we went into a pylon again in a greenhouse and we grew the plants to maturity in order to come with the calculations of uh, how much salt can be retained by the whole plant. We divided, you know, in underground parts, the roots, uh, aerial plants, uh, aerial parts, the leaves. Okay. So what we found is that we um, optimize the substrate, we optimize the, 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 the plants, and we calculated the capacity of, of all these plants. So then we come to the two pilots in the field. So we went to enclosures in the, uh, in the lake and we apply the treatments that I said for the controlling the phosphorus. So we went there and uh, we use in one alum plus the uh, calcite active, cl active layer and we measure. We simulated coagulation, we simulated all of that and uh, we, we compare. So this is in lake and we have these modules. This is at 10 days. So here, this is the blank. Nothing was put here. This is where we just put alum. This is where we put alum plus calcite. And this is just calcite alone because people said alum may be some toxicity, but it was a very low concentration. So this is 30 days after. So you can see that these two really work very, very good. And um, in numbers, we can have the efficiency with calcite and with alum and calcite around 96%, 92%. After three months, calcite was still showing low concentration of phosphorus. So this was good. So project one gave us the concentration of alum and uh, um, how to, how to uh, run uh, the conditions of the test. We went and measured the different efflu uh, affluents and uh, to uh, make the dimensions of a wetland. So we know how much sodium and, and uh, phosphorus and uh, chloride we wanted to treat and, uh, and the flows. And with that, we designed um, a whole system. So we have a retention basin, we have the wetland, and we have the uh, filter bed. So we went and we constructed this in the on site in one of uh, very close to the highway, and we we planted the plants, the hollow hollowfied plants. We planted. This is a view of last summer. So this is the way it goes. So we had by this time we had the 19 plants. So this is, was last year in 2014. So we have Atriplex, Tifa, Salicornia, and what we find is that there are some plants that are hyper-accumulative of salts, and there are others that retain some, but not as, as efficiently as other. We have the, uh, uh, the treatment of the salt during the operation of 2012, so we, we see that efficiency went from 40% to 60%, so that is, was very encouraging. The plants in the roots, they also retain the metals, which was very interesting for us. And as a conclusion, so we, ha we know that the alum plus the uh, active layer in the bottom uh, were good 
for retention of the phosphorus and the heavy metals. Our test showed that all the plants retain very small or very high concentrations of the, of the salts. And that uh, because it is an open system, it's difficult to make a global mass balance, but it gives us very encouraging results. Um, Ministry of Transport is now operating our wetlands, so we know that they are happy with that. And also, we apply this system now from many other, in other places. In Europe here, in France, we have two. In Brazil, we have one. And uh, we're um, in, in uh, two places in Ontario. So we're very happy with that. Of course, you know, all of this work, it's impossible without the help of uh, so many people, students, PhDs, and, uh, but also the funding agency. And, and in Canada, we are very much in relationship with companies like uh, Acción Agua, you know? So it's, it's very important. In our case, the company De So is like um, consulting engineering firms, and, uh, uh, and, and, and so they can also give funding uh, for this type of project. So thank you very much. <laughs>